Well, the next speaker to, tonight is uh, is a lady who I met first in 1958. She is quite an old friend of this farm. She, I think, made her first trip up here about 24 years ago. She is today, I think, the only woman in the United States that I can think of who is the executive director of a national voluntary health agency, of which she is the founder of that health agency, which is the National Council on Alcoholism. She's one of the first girls in AA that I know anything about. She uh, is one of the outstanding field, uh, people in the field of American public health today because alcoholism is coming to be so much more recognized as a disease, as an illness. The stigma is being greatly reduced about the alcoholic and alcoholism. And in no small way, the progress that's been made in the field of alcoholism over the last few years in making this disease a socially acceptable disease, getting people to recognize that it's a treatable illness, is in no small measure due to her. Now, this is part of her life. This is the other part of her life. But Marty has the same problem that I had with alcohol. He has the same problem that Wes had with alcohol. The fight back for her not only included alcoholism, but, but cancer. She's a remarkable woman and a lady that I like to call my friend. I sometimes slip up and call her the big M to her face. You know, they had a mer big Mercury automobile a few years ago. They used to call it the big M. And she would come through sometimes just like a big M, you know. So I sometimes slip up and call her that, but it's all done pretty much in joking, and, and I think she takes it that way. <laughs> so Marty, I'm sure we uh, will all welcome you and well, it's good to have you back. You said that you would come back on my fifth if I ever got that far. <laughs> That's true, Fifth. And it doesn't seem a minute since you and Wes and I were up here four years ago and you had asked me to come up to your first anniversary, which I was happy to do, and I then said, now don't ask me again till you make five, if you ever do. I must say that I was very startled when you telephoned me and said, you know, it's five this summer and the date is August 3rd. Because these four years have slipped by very fast. In talking both to Cliff and Wes before the meeting, when I was debating what I would talk about and what I would say and wondering how many of you were here for the first time, how many of you had come back to have another try, and how many of you were just visiting so I could kind of gauge what would be the best thing to do. They both said the same thing. Tell your AA story. Now, for me, that's a chore because I've told it so many thousands of times it bores me stiff. Also, I'm terribly aware of the tendency of the alcoholic, and my name is Marty Mann and I am an alcoholic, to exaggerate or dress up something the further you get away from it. And I'm always scared to death in telling my story that I'll contradict something I told a year ago somewhere and somebody will remember it. And they'll say, you know, that gal's just a plain liar. I don't tend to be, and I do try to be accurate, but I would like to begin by telling a little bit of how I first came to this farm. For it is true, I paid the first visit to it of any AAs, and I have been coming back here now for, it'll be 24 years this fall. And that leads me back to how I got in the spot where I could meet the person that brought me up here the first time. My drinking had progressed while I was living in England to a point where I had visited a good many doctors and asked for advice on it. 
And mostly what they were telling me was that I was a victim of anxiety neurosis, that I was working too hard, that I was burning the candle at both ends, that what I needed was to get away from it all and have a rest. Well, I worked for my living and I couldn't just walk out. But I did the next best thing. My partner and I sold our business in London and I took a job running a hotel in the country. This seemed to me a pretty radical change and it was certainly taking me to a quiet place. And it was certainly taking me to a quiet place. And I thought this would solve it. When I arrived there, it occurred to me that it would be a very good idea if I quit drinking for a while. And as I recall, it was just the beginning of Lent. So I decided I'd go on the wagon for Lent. I'd never gone on the wagon before. And of course, the most awful things happened to me and I didn't know what they were. I had the shakes and I had the sweats and I had the cold shivers and I couldn't sleep at night and I couldn't eat anything and I was scared to death and I went to the local doctor. He described my symptoms and he said, well, you've just come down from London. It looks to me like you caught some tropical disease. <laughs> and I'm not quite sure what it is or what to do about it, so we'll just put you to bed for a few days and give you rest and feed you carefully and see what happens. Well, of course, in about three days, I felt just fine, and he thought he was the brightest doctor in Great Britain because he'd cured an unknown tropical disease very rapidly. This was how little I knew of what was wrong with me or what happened to people like me or what could still happen because this was not the end of the road for me or the end of my drinking. I didn't last the 40 days of Lent. But I didn't go back to my ordinary kind of drinking because I thought I'll just drink beer and that'll be all right. Incidentally, before I had ever moved to the country, I had tried a number of other uh, experiments that most of us try one way or another. I went on the champagne wagon for a while because I figured that that was expensive and I wouldn't get it all the time and I went broke buying my own champagne. I went on the sherry wagon and I went everywhere with a bottle under each arm because everybody didn't have sherry. And I drank enough of it to float a ship and saw spots in front of my eyes for weeks. That is the worst thing to go on. I warn you, if you're going back to drinking, don't go on the sherry wagon. It affects your liver more directly and more painfully than any other drink you could take. And it's horrible anyway. Sickly and sweet and nasty. <laughs> Nevertheless, the beer wagon was a new one, so I was going to try beer. And very shortly, I discovered that right around the corner from this little inn that I was managing and backing up on this corner so that I could reach it out the back door through an apple orchard was a little pub that sold old beer. Well, I hadn't known anything about old beer before, but I soon found out it's aged in the keg and it's has as high an alcohol content as whiskey or brandy or any other hard liquor. So I did right well on old beer. I was getting just as drunk, just as fast as if I had been drinking whiskey. Needless to say, in due course, I left that hotel. Uh, not under a cloud exactly, but when one of the owners dared to speak to me about my drinking, I left in high dudgeon. And then I had a period of time where I was simply staying with friends. This is kind of rough. It was really rough on them and they all found a reason why that room was needed for some other purpose. And I was a lost soul and a wanderer. And I ended up going back to London, sodden from morning till night, able always to borrow a pound or two and get a bottle going out to Hyde Park where for a penny you hired a deck chair and sitting all day in the deck chair with the bottle under the chair drinking. And my ex-partner who was a German boy that thought rather a lot of me was so distressed and disturbed he'd come out there and look for me until he found me and try to persuade me to do something. 
And eventually, things got so bad, I was ready to let somebody else decide what I should do. And he called another friend of mine, a trained nurse that had taken care of me when I jumped out a window and smashed myself up, drunk. And who had since married her, boy, her childhood sweetheart and was living in a little tiny fishing village in Scotland. And she said, put her on a train and send her up here. That train trip was something I will never forget. France didn't mean it to be this way, but we got to the station just after the bars closed. We couldn't get a bottle for me to have. I was going third class, sitting up on a hard bench. I had a little dog. I wasn't on one of the crack fast trains. I was on a slow train. And I had to sit up all night, coming to pieces with the need for a drink and unable to find one when I got off because they have such things as closing hours in England and nothing was open. And I remember that we got to Inverness in the morning, which is pretty far up in Scotland, but it's where you change from the train from England and you get a little local train that takes another two hours to get where I was going, further up. And I could barely get off that train. <coughs> When I got off, I discovered that one of my suitcases was missing. Everything I had in the world was with me in three suitcases, and I only had two. So in my state of scarcely being able to speak, I was able to work up a splendid temper. And I found the station master, and I raised Cain about this missing suitcase and said I wouldn't go a step further until it was found and restored to me. And it was the railroad's responsibility to take care of me until this happened. You know, he agreed. I think probably he took one look at what must have been a wild-eyed female looking pretty ghastly, and he was scared of me. But they gave me a room in the station hotel. And there's a very curious thing about uh, England and its closing hours. They don't apply to a person staying in a hotel in their room. You can order something up to your room right around the clock. So I hold into this room, which was the loveliest looking thing I'd ever seen. It was about four by six, barely room for me to get in. And I ordered up some drinks and I felt a whole lot better. And I was there all night before they found my suitcase. They did find it. And the next day I went on my way, well fortified. And I spent many months in Scotland, just trying to get over the physical effects of my drinking and tying one on with considerable regularity because you can drink anywhere in the world. And also I discovered that the men drank a drink I was very fond of in Scotland. The normal drink was a double scotch and a beer chaser. We call it a boiler maker in this country. But you can get drunk awful fast on that combination. And this was dandy until it began to result in some very peculiar behavior on my part and they didn't even want me up there. But meanwhile, I decided that I had to go home, that I was quite convinced that I had lost my mind. I knew I couldn't work. I figured that perhaps what had happened was I'd been away from home too long. I'd been living abroad for seven years and I'd never come back. And I was uprooted. That if I went home, I might find my way back to sanity. And somehow or other, you know, drunks can manage the most amazing things. I found some people that would lend me the money. Land, my God, they gave it to me. I never paid it back. I didn't even know where or who they were when I finally got sober some years later. And I got home. And of course, I wasn't going to drink on the boat. My sister was going to meet me at the other end. And guess what? I was the last person off the boat and I was carried off. Seven years away, I never saw the New York skyline. I never saw the Statue of Liberty. I didn't even know we'd arrived. And for the next year, I was pretty steadily drunk. And yet during that year, I would have times when I would set about trying to find some help. By this time, I was absolutely convinced that I was insane. And so I went to the natural place. 
Through my sister and some of my own old friends that I had looked up, I got names of psychiatrists and psychoanalysts, and I started going to see them. Well, I didn't have sense enough to lie about my drinking. I told them why I thought I was insane. I described the way I drank and the things I said and did and the blackouts I had and all the rest of it. And every one of those doctors, I was very fortunate, I apparently had gone to good people who had sent me to good doctors, refused to take me on. In 1937, the psychiatrists did not know that there was such a thing as alcoholism. The word was never used. They didn't know what it was and they didn't know what to do with it. And I will verify that in a minute when I tell you that the eighth one I went to see at the end of a year told me he did not think I was insane. He didn't know what it was that was wrong with me, but he did know that people like me had one chance in 100 to recover. This was mostly what he knew about this. He told me that he would take me on as a patient and he would put me in a hospital. And since I had no money, he would put me in a hospital where he had an appointment and its name was Bellevue. And I wasn't very happy about this, but I was ready to do anything. And so the day after New Year's, I'd seen him about three days before New Year's, on January 2nd, 1938, I entered the neurological ward of Bellevue. He said there were two reasons that he was putting me there, apart from the fact that he was the head of the neurological division of Bellevue. One was that he did not think I was insane. He didn't think I belonged in the psychiatric section. The second was that in the psychiatric section, you were kept for a very short time and then shipped out to a state mental institution and he proposed to keep me as his patient and see if we couldn't find out what the matter was. And I could stay longer in the neurological ward. Well, I stayed there seven months. And in that seven months, I became more and more convinced that something had cracked or gone wrong in my head and that just staying in a hospital ward and talking to this very nice guy once a week was not going to put it right. So I began hammering on him that what I needed was psychiatric treatment, that what was wrong with me was in my head no matter what he thought, and that I wanted a psychiatrist. He was a good man, Dr. Kennedy. He finally produced one. He produced a young psychiatrist that was doing some research work in Bellevue and who was willing to see me when he could, when he had free time, at no charge. And about the fifth time that I saw this young man, when I'd given him a pretty good rundown of the situation, he said, you know, I believe you're right. He said, you need long-term psychotherapy. I haven't got the time for you and it's irregular and I can see you twice in one week and then not for two weeks and this isn't fair and I will tell Dr. Kennedy so and he did. And Dr. Kennedy started shopping for a private sanitarium that would take a patient who didn't have any money to pay for it. Dr. Kennedy was rather a big gun and he had lots of very rich patients. So there were several hospitals that were willing to listen to Dr. Kennedy's suggestion about a patient he had that didn't have any money. But the one that accepted me was in Greenwich. It was called Blythewood, and the medical director was a man named Dr. Tebow. And Dr. Tebow took me on because, as Dr. Kennedy put it, I wanted so badly to get well that he thought maybe I might be a success. Well, I was in Blythewood 15 months. But when I moved from my seven months in Bellevue, in a ward overlooking the East River, a ward that had 34 women in it, most of them neurological cases, they had, there were brain tumors and spinal tumors and paralysis and multiple sclerosis. 
And there were three women in there that had had what we call today polyneuropathy, but which in those days was called alcoholic neuritis. And they were completely paralyzed from the waist down. And there was no return because their muscles had atrophied. And while I was there, those three women, one after another, was transferred were transferred to the hospital for incurables over on the island, never to come out again. Every one of those three girls had been drinking the way I had, because we compared notes. But they weren't there for their alcoholism. I remind you, the word was not in use then. Nobody used it. It wasn't on any charts. My chart had me down as a manic depressive. Who drank? to excess, to be sure, but that was way down the list. I think it's important that we remember how very recently people like us didn't even have one chance in a hundred. It wasn't that one in a hundred could get well if they were given help. Ninety-nine out of a hundred didn't get any chance at help. And there wasn't anybody to tell them what was wrong with them. And there wasn't anybody to suggest what they might do about it if they could tell them what was wrong with them. This isn't very long ago. And people who today are seeking help and finding it in places like this and in AA groups all over the world, and today in many doctors' offices who do know about alcoholism and do know what can be done about it and do make referrals to AA, and treat these cases themselves, sometimes successfully, we don't realize what a miracle has been wrought in a very short time. And you out there, who may be here for the first time, you don't realize how lucky you are. You didn't have to spend five years trying to find out what was wrong with you. You didn't have to lie awake nights try trying on labels for yourself to see if they fit Manic depressive, I found that on my chart. Schizophrenic, I figured that too. I didn't know much about these things, but that was a split personality. And I certainly was a different personality when I drank than when I was sober, so I figured that fit too. Paranoid, well, when I was drunk, I had delusions of grandeur. When I had a hangover, I was the most persecuted person in the world, so I also fit that diagnosis. Oh, I could find a whole lot of mental illnesses that fit me. The trouble was too many of them fit me. And the doctors wouldn't settle on one of them. But just remember, as you go on your merry way, resisting the help that is being so freely offered you, debating with yourself, if you please, whether you could be fallen so low as to be this ghastly thing called an alcoholic. I wish you were trying in 1937 to find out what the hell was the matter with you. You'd have been in the position I was in. When Dr. Tebow, after nearly a year, during which I periodically went out and got stinking falling down drunk, handed me a manuscript and said, this tells about a group of people that seem to be doing something about this condition that you share with them. They're like you. Why don't you read it? And you would understand how I felt when I saw the title, Alcoholics Anonymous. And when I started to read what an alcoholic was and what alcoholism was, my God, if anybody would given me the moon on a platter, they couldn't have given me anything more wonderful than to know that I had something specific that had a name. I'd like to say one other thing about my many months in that institution. Or 500 acres comprised Blythewood. And it had some 15 or 20 different houses scattered around it. 
But at the gateway, when you came in, was a very big old mansion that had belonged to a political boss in New York, and he'd really built it grand. And this was the building that housed the doctor's offices downstairs, and it had some very elegant rooms and suites of rooms upstairs, which were inhabited by people who were about to leave. Because it did not have a nurse on duty at the end of every corridor, people could walk in or out without being observed. And so they spent the last few weeks of their stay in this house, kind of getting used to being free. A little further down the driveway was the entry house, Blythewood's leper colony. It's where people were brought when they came in screaming in a straitjacket. A lot of them did. This wasn't just for alcoholics. There were all kinds of cases there. But there were quite a number of alcoholics there. And then there was the place known as the Middle House, which is where most people spent most of their time. Scattered around in the woods far off were houses inhabited by people who'd been there for years and who might very well die there, whose mental disorientation was so complete that they could not ever go out in the world again, and who apparently were not amenable to any kind of treatment. And there was a little house down on the other side of a tiny golf course, which was known as the Violent House. It had a padded cell in it. And people who were really raising cane were taken there first. And we used to go by this house on our way to the pottery up in the woods and hear the screams very often. In the 15 months I spent in the middle house, I saw a great many people who had come in to the violent house down by the golf course or the leper colony on the way over, move into the middle house where I was, and after a while, move on to the gatehouse, the great big house by the gate, and leave. They had recovered. But I stayed on. And I began to think, and this was before I got the book, that whatever it was that I had, which was probably a combination of all the worst mental diseases in existence, Nothing could be done about it. It was clearly incurable, and it was much worse to have walked in under my own steam as I had, fresh from seven months in Bellevue, than it was to be brought in in a straitjacket screaming, because those people seemed to get well. When I arrived at this place, however, straight from Bellevue, it looked like paradise. It was in summer. I got there in July. And I came out of the hot city, and this was 500 green acres, and there were flower gardens, and there was a lovely recreation room, and big common room, and a nice dining room, and it was a little bit different from the way we ate in Bellevue. The food was a little bit different, too. We didn't have to get up at six, at five in the morning, which you had to at Bellevue, because Bellevue's run for the convenience of the nurses, you know, and the doctors, not for the patients. This is true of a great many hospitals, and it's one of the terrible things about many hospitals, in my opinion. You know, you could sleep until 7.30 and have breakfast at 8. Your day was planned for you. Everything about it was attractive to me. Everything about it I liked. Of course, I was frightened. This was a whole new group of people. I didn't know what they were going to be like, what state they'd be in. But I was greeted almost immediately by two young women about my own age who asked me to eat with them at their table in the dining room, and they were tables for four, and who made me welcome. Now, one of them I already knew had been having trouble with alcohol because she had been the subject of some newspaper headlines just a week or two before when she'd escaped from a hospital in the middle of the night clad only in her mink coat and her bedroom slippers, which had high heels, and had completely disappeared. 
And when her husband had found her, she had done the cleverest thing I've ever heard of. She was in the Martha Washington Hotel, drunk as a skunk. They never would have found her because nobody would have looked there. It's a very proper place, which is why she'd been bright enough to pick it. Accepting that she was using her charge accounts and having some clothes sent down so she could get out during the day. And that was just what her husband thought she'd do and had them traced, and it was quite easy to pick her up. So she had been taken up to Blythewood. So I knew that she and I had a lot in common. But the other girl, whose name was Nona, was a very serious-looking person. And she said that she was simply there convalescing from an operation. Well, very shortly thereafter, she left, and she lived nearby in Old Greenwich. And she liked Martha and me, and we were still stuck in this place. So she used to ask us over occasionally for lunch and a swim, and we went with delight and spent time with her. After Martha left, however, this kind of fell off, and I didn't see any more of her. And now we get back to the point where I got the book. I'm not going to describe what it did to me but I had a very violent and very wonderful spiritual experience and completely accepted everything in the book, not just the fact that I was an alcoholic and that there was a disease called alcoholism, but everything else in it, and began reading it religiously so that I came to know it almost by heart. And after a period of time in which I was afraid to meet these people and Dr. Tebow clapped down on me and said, you're going into New York and you're going to a meeting, and I went, and I met these people. I'd always been afraid of strange groups. I had never liked meeting new people or strangers. I always felt like an outsider looking in. The only thing that made me comfortable was liquor, and if I couldn't have liquor, it was just plain hell. So I didn't look forward to meeting all these people. Besides, I was scared to death. I had some very strange mental pictures of them. In the first place, I thought most of them would be bums, mission stiffs. And those that weren't, I thought would be praying mantises. And I was sure they'd all look like funeral directors and start praying over me. And I had my own brand of belief now after my experience, and I didn't want them meddling with it. But when I went in, they were just people. They accepted me instantly. There had been one woman ahead of me. She had gone down to Washington to try to start a group there, and she was not staying sober. And so they were particularly glad to see me. They very much wanted a woman member. And I felt completely at home and at ease with them. I discovered in two seconds flat that we talked the same language, we thought in the same terms, they understood me as no one ever had, and I understood them. In fact, I said that night, you know, you, I can finish your sentences, and you sure are finishing mine. We were communicating. I guess I had never really communicated with other human beings before. Not really, and never in that way. And it was a wonderful feeling. Dr. Tebow kept me at Blythewood a few more months. He wanted to see what this thing was. I was his test case, his guinea pig. He observed me. And what he saw convinced him that Alcoholics Anonymous was a very wonderful thing, and he became the first psychiatrist to give it all-out support and to regularly send his patients to AA. I was due to be discharged about the middle of September. But during those summer months, I was rushing all over Greenwich and Old Greenwich and Riverside and Coscob and all of the neighboring towns looking for cases to do 12-step work on. I tried everybody in the sanitarium. There were only four or five that summer. I got one. The others were not very eager. But among other things, I went to clergymen and I went to doctors. And I had permission to do this. And I myself went back to church and I was born and brought up an Episcopalian. 
And I went to the little church in Old Greenwich, and I made a special effort with that minister. And he said, well, he said, I have a couple in my parish. They're both, they both drink too much. I wish you could help them. And I said, well, see if I can go see them. Well, he said, I'll ask them. And the next time I saw him, he said, they nearly threw me out. They do not want to see you. And in the course of the conversation, I trapped him into giving their names, and of course it was Nona and her husband. I still didn't feel that I could barge in on her, and I was still hoping that it might be brought about some other way. But you see, she'd been so cagey about it, she didn't even tell Martha and me when we were swapping experiences as to how we came to be in Blythewood. She'd stuck to her story. She was just recuperating from an operation. She was really resisting and concealing. A day or two before I left, I forget what... I forget whether it was one or two days, an ambulance drove up to the leper colony, and they brought out a stretcher with someone in a straitjacket, and it was Nona, brought back. And I was leaving, but I had been invited to come back every weekend if I wanted to, and I was going to be in New York, so it wasn't very difficult, and I was delighted at the opportunity. And I did come back every weekend, and Nona had a different doctor. She didn't have Tebo. And I asked her doctor if I could talk to her, and he said no. He didn't believe in this crackpot thing that I'd got into. He didn't think this experience of mine was normal. He thought I probably was nuts. Uh, he didn't say it that way to me, but he implied it. And he didn't want me messing around with his patients, so I couldn't do anything about it while she was there under his care. And I was very sorry about it. But about three weeks later, in New York, I received a telegram from this doctor saying, Nona has run away, is in New York at the Hotel Shelton in great trouble. Please go see her. Signed by the doctor's name, who would have none of it. And I instantly went over to the Hotel Shelton, and I found Nona in ghastly condition, ready to jump out a window, literally. I was scared to death. I didn't know what to do about it. I was afraid I couldn't overpower her. She was quite a tall, strong girl. And we had an AA member at that time who was a doctor. And I called him and asked him to come right away, and he did. And he put her under. He gave her some sedatives, <coughs> quieted her down, and he said, somebody will have to stay with her. And I can get a night nurse for eight hours from midnight to eight o'clock. If you'll stay till midnight and then relieve her at eight, I can get someone to come. So I stayed till midnight when the nurse came and Nona was asleep by then and I was back at eight to take up the watch. And Nona was awake and in pretty bad shape. And I had brought with me a copy of the book, Alcoholics Anonymous. And I sat by the bedside and I read her that book. And as I went along and she would say, stop, let me rest a while, and I would stop reading, and she began to tell me about what she had been doing to cope with her drinking. Some three years before, a friend of hers and her husband's had suggested that they go up to a place in Connecticut that was owned and run by a very eccentric old lady. And it was a kind of spiritual retreat for people in trouble. And it was a nonprofit corporation with a board of directors. It was called the Ministry of the High Watch. And this friend of theirs was a member of the board. And he had brought them up here. And for three summers, they had come here. Nona would come up with their little boy as soon as school was out and stay all summer and never touch a drop or even want one. 
Walter came up every weekend, and he never drank here. And what they couldn't understand was how could they stay sober here, but when they got home again, they couldn't stay sober. But as I read this book to Nona, she kept saying to me, you know, this is what Sister Frances means. This is what she's trying to do. You have got to meet Sister Frances. You've got to go up and see the farm. Well, Nona was half out of her mind. She was so sick, and incidentally, she wouldn't touch a drink. I brought a bottle in, because God knows she needed tapering off, but she wouldn't touch it. And by the end of that day, I knew a great deal about this place, and about Sister Frances, and about the little chapel, and about the cottages all around. And I had agreed with Nona that as soon as she was well enough, I would certainly come up and see this place and meet Sister Frances. About a week later, or a few days less, maybe, Nona met with her husband to discuss their divorce. Proceedings had already been started, and they were just to discuss the business end of it. And Walter was absolutely amazed, they met in the bar, of course, that Nona wouldn't take a drink and that she was perfectly sober. And she told him what had happened, and she told him about AA. And Walter said, that's what I want. Let's forget the divorce. You take me with you to that meeting. And Walter stopped drinking. <clears throat> so it wasn't long, just a week or so, before Walter and Nona arranged a weekend for those of us who they could persuade to come to come up and see this farm. And it was Bill and Lois, and a man named Horace Crystal, and another man named Bert Taylor and myself. And we drove up here on a Saturday morning and got here a little afternoon, and it was a beautiful autumn day, and the little house didn't look very different than it does now. Anyway, when we opened the door, and Bill started to go in. He turned to me and he said, My God, Marty, you could cut it with a knife. And I knew what he was talking about because I felt it too. There was an atmosphere in that house. In fact, it was all over these hills. Like nothing I'd ever felt before. It was a kind of a concentration of all of the peace and the inner serenity and the satisfaction and the comfort that you've ever dreamed about. It was almost like the living presence of God. Sister Frances instantly turned us to the left and showed us the chapel before we even went in the living room, and then we both understood. Because this was where it emanated from. And that chapel is there today just as it was the day I walked in. And that atmosphere still emanates from these hills all around you. And this is what rubs off, Cliff, if you want to know. And it's been here longer than we have. Because when Sister Frances started on her own spiritual search for a place that could become a spiritual retreat, she searched for three years before she found this one. And she always claimed that that atmosphere was already here. That all that she had done was to see that people could recognize it and feel it and give them a place in which they could sit quietly and bathe in it, the chapel. We spent a wonderful weekend here. And Sister Frances was tremendously impressed with us and with AA and with its philosophy and its ideas and its ideals. And by Sunday afternoon, she said, you people take this place. You can make greater use of it than I can. And Bill said, no, we won't take this place. AA wants no property, wants no money, just enough to do our job. But we never want to own property. We don't want to run places. We don't want to run hospitals or drying out places or nursing homes or rest homes or anything else. No, we won't take this place but we'll use it if we may. 
And that's how it began. And this was in October, and during that winter, I came up here many times, bringing people I was trying to help and staying with them. Sister Frances lived here then. She's 90 now. She was 66 then, and she looked just the same. She was a little withered apple. And a very, very wonderful human being. And I gained and learned a tremendous amount from her. And gradually I became such a fixture here that I had my own cabin. And for a number of years I spent all my summer vacations here and I came up winter and summer because when she lived here it was open the year round. Because when she lived here it was open the year round. And one year when she wanted to go away and there was no one to run this house, my mother came up and ran this place for almost a year. And then I was here very frequently. But most of all, I remember the last slip I had. For I didn't have a completely clear record. That's why I don't celebrate an anniversary. And my first really bad slip, the person that I ran to and ended the slip with is right here at the moment. And she can tell you about that. She says, I always tell about it. Well, I'll let Susan tell you about it. I arrived on her doorstep with an enormous paper bag filled with beer. And she greeted me very warmly. She claims now that that was the trouble. You know, I shouldn't have brought her the beer. <laughs> that was the first one, and that was a really bad one. And then I had another mild one the following summer. And then again at Christmas time, for that was a bad time for me for many, many years. And I still feel a little queasy beginning in Thanksgiving and don't feel entirely settled until New Year's Day. I don't like the holidays. They do something funny to me. This was Christmas week, and I got started. And I had a friend that had a place up near New Milford, and she thought maybe that she could help me and asked me to come up there for the weekend. And I got on a train and was met in New Milford, and I was in such bad shape she didn't dare take me home, so she took me to the Green Hotel. And the next morning she said, I think I better take you up to the farm. The snow was very deep. The roads were very icy and very bad. We couldn't come in the front way. That was a terrific road in those days. It was nothing like it is today. But there was a back road that came around that wasn't quite such a steep hill to go up, and we knew the car wouldn't get up the hill with the ice and the snow. So we started coming in the back way, and we hadn't said anything about coming. I was in no shape to anyway. And I guess she hadn't thought of it, or she thought maybe if she called, they wouldn't take me, and she wanted to get rid of me. So we started driving in the back way in a big old Cadillac, and we bogged down almost a mile from the house, and the snow was hip deep. And me, with one of the worst hangovers I've ever had, was floundering through the snow trying to get to this little house. And finally got there. And there were three men in residence. One of them was a boy, and he was a boy. He was in his mid-twenties when he first came to AA, whom I had been trying to help, and who had been in and out, and in and out, and in and out, and by now he was about 29. And he looked up and just beamed when he saw me. It was New Year's Eve, you see. He said, oh, Marty, you've come up to give us a lift. I said, hell, I've come up to get over a drunk. And he wasn't very happy about that. But I stayed here for a number of days until I got myself back on my feet. And that, I suppose, was the time when this farm meant the most personally to me. And thereafter, I came back very, very frequently. I found nourishment here. I found peace here. I found a place where I could stop and think 
where I could take myself apart and put myself together again. And I found something in that little chapel that I haven't lost yet. For many years after that, I was on the board of directors of this farm, and I saw it go through many, many changes and many, many troubled and problem years. It had its ups and downs. It didn't become an AA place all at once. It was gradual. And it didn't find the right leadership all at once. That was gradual, too. But when I come back now and I see what's going on here, and I meet and talk to the people who got their start here, and I know many besides Cliff. Most of the ones he mentioned of his class are people I know quite well. I feel that that visit in October 1939 was an historic one. And I feel that my connection with this place has been an historic connection. It has meant much to me it can mean much to you. There is more here than just the bride. For instance, I was struck by a sentence that Wes spoke. He said that whenever he had been faced with responsibility, he had run to the bottle. Sobriety, you know, is just the beginning. You have to get sober before you can even understand the 12 steps, let alone practice them. Because as long as you are putting alcohol into your brain, you are twisting and distorting it, even in small amounts. And until you are entirely free of alcohol, your body is absolutely clear of it. You can't even make a beginning at straight thinking. And let me tell you that straight thinking doesn't come overnight. In my case, I think it took five years. That is, if I can ever claim to have developed really straight thinking, at least this is my goal and this is what I'm trying for. But any kind of equilibrium, any kind of feeling of balance, any kind of inner security, inner sureness that I had set my feet on the right road and I was going to keep them there. This took five years. My last slip came a year and a half after I came into AA and I had some awfully near misses in the next few years, awfully close. And I think you must recognize but getting sober is only the beginning. Sobriety alone is not enough. Because if that's all you have, you're going to lose it in a hell of a hurry. The first time anything goes wrong. The first time you face up against a real problem. The first time you are asked to assume a real responsibility. This is what most of us have been ducking. This is what most of us don't want to take. We would love to be happy, carefree children for the rest of our lives till we die at 90. Wouldn't we be cute? That's just what we are, pretty cute. Trying to act like nine-year-olds without a care in the world. Refusing to accept the responsibilities of our years, our adult years. Ducking and running every which way, usually into a bar, but certainly into a bottle. This is the kind of thing we have been doing. This is the kind of thing we can no longer afford to do. Because this is what has been running us right into the ground. Running us into tragedy. Running us into despair. Running us into either insanity or death. Because that's the end for us. If we don't quit. A lot of people have asked me, 
What makes some people want to quit? Well, I agree with Wes. I don't think very many people come to AA wanting to quit. I didn't. And I have no AA friends who, if they're honest, did. We all come in wanting to learn how to control our drinking again. We all come in wanting to straighten ourselves out sufficiently to get the heat off so we can be free to do what we please. None of us wants to accept our own adulthood. None of us wants to accept the responsibilities that go with being an adult. All of us would like to play in a field without a care in the world for as long as we live. But I don't think that's going to happen to anyone on this earth. Maybe it will in the next life, I don't know. But as long as we're here, we either have to get with it and grow and do our share, or we have to give up and die. For us, with our particular illness, those are the only two choices. It's really been put straight to us, and we can make up our minds. Which road do you want to walk on? Do you want to walk up? Up, you know, means up. It's a climb. Going up, you have to work. It gets you out of breath, pulls the muscles in your legs. You get real tired. Or do you want to go down? That's easy. You can just sit still and slide. Right into that mucky puddle at the bottom. The choice is yours. Wes is right. No one else can put the desire to stop drinking into you. But I can tell you this. That attendance at AA meetings... And listening to those who have trod the same road before you can put that desire into your heart. No one of us individually can give a needle to you that will contain desire to stop drinking. And no one of you, I don't believe, came here with that desire already in you. You just wanted to feel better, get the heat off, and control it next time. That's what you wanted. But in due course, you will find that that is not possible for you. And you'll learn to stop being an idiot and beating your head against a stone wall. And open your ears and listen. And you who are up here can listen to more than just Wes's voice or our voices up here or the voices of each other. You can listen to the hills, and the stars, and the sky. And you can listen to that thing that a little old lady, now 90 years old, found here and added to and made available to all of us. And you can be grateful that you had the chance to taste it. Thank you. those who care to join me in closing the meeting in the usual way. <clears throat> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power of the glory forever and ever. Amen. I uh, have a couple of telegrams here that uh, I'd like to read. One is from Florida, from two very, very good friends of the farm, and friends of many of the people in the room. 
May the higher power continue to help with the wonderful work that you are doing. Love to all. Amy and Dick. And another one just came in. Congratulations to S.K., Marty, and all my other friends. Only illness keeps me away tonight. Dinner, one of the nice things about spring. One of the nice things about spring is that High Watch will soon be open. It's a blessed place. Dr. Ruth Fox. And I also want to take this occasion to thank uh, Mr. Hazel, the banquet manager of the Columbia Club, and their staff for the excellent job that they do for, here, for us here year after year. I think the dinner was magnificent, and uh, let's hear it for the Columbia staff. <laughs> you know, there's a lot that's gone into High Watch, and of course our speaker tonight uh, is the one that had the foresight uh, to envision a future for a place of the kind, of that kind. And uh, I think that one of the greatest things about the farm is the fact, uh, not necessarily the work it's doing now, uh, but the fact that it was there and it served as the forerunner of many hundreds of places uh, similar uh, that are operating now in this country and abroad. And so uh, I think that uh, uh, this is a really significant thing, the fact that the farm was started, the fact that other places have started, uh, places that can help the al alcoholic in a uh, particularly significant way. Uh, as I say, Marty had the division, and when, uh, when I went there eight years ago, and this is our ninth season, uh, I didn't expect to last this long. <laughs> I expect that the board had a meeting and did rehire me tonight. They didn't say anything about it. But uh, we've taken it for granted that I'm going to work that issue. The, uh, when I first went there, I, I was green, of course. And uh, we talked about the principles that, uh, that Marty had uh, felt were necessary in the beginning. And we've tried to adhere to them. We've tried to do as much good as we could for people and uh, let the finances take care of themselves, more or less. And uh, everything has worked out very successfully. Now, this hasn't been, uh, this hasn't been a one-man job. Uh, it hasn't uh, been a family deal either, or a husband and wife deal, necessarily. Uh, because we have had the guidance of any number of people on our board of directors who uh, did help us did help us a great deal and kept us from making many mistakes. In addition to that, we've had the cooperation of many, many wonderful people on our staff. And so it has been a labor of love on the part of a great many people, and uh, I hope that we can continue on for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Has everybody got a ticket? No. All right. Uh, will you raise your hand and somebody will see that you get a ticket? But, uh, last year it was won by a man from New Milford and he assigned it to another man from New Milford. And uh, he's been sober ever since and he's here tonight. I hope he wins. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I overlooked when uh, I made my little talk, I'm, I'm a little upset tonight. I'm, uh, moved by this occasion. I always am because there's so much love in this room that I forgot the, uh, the love and affection that's closest to me and, and uh, the person that's uh, helped me most at the farm, and that's my wife, Kay. Uh, last year at the Connecticut Convention, the convention chairman was a graduate of High Watch Farm. The program chairman, who did an excellent job and who was here taping the meeting tonight, was a graduate of High Watch Farm. And uh, the latest graduate to receive uh, an honor was uh, uh, the 
Tommy Dayton of the Cheshire Group, who was elected delegate to the General Service Conference from Connecticut, who was also a graduate of High Watch Farm, and I'm going to ask Tommy to come up and draw the number. Tickets now. One, two, five, oh, six. Ah. Okay. You got it. Two. <laughs> From Waterbury. I'm, uh, I'll mention that the, the uh, young lady that drew the number was only one number away from winning herself. <laughs> well, not much more from me, but, uh, you know, uh, Wes was saying that he's uh, nervous. Well, I am, too. And here I am. Uh, somebody says, now, don't forget your wife. And I says, I'm saving it for later, but I better say it now before later, and then I'll forget. And uh, my wife uh, is my wife. Helen, who stuck by me all through. And also sitting out uh, in the audience uh, is our uh, ex-president and his wife, Bob Hitchens, Annie Lane. Now, uh, Marty and I uh, met uh, out here in the hall for this evening before the meeting, and uh, we had a little chat. And uh, the last time that I was sitting as I'm uh, sitting tonight was, oh, I guess about 12 years ago, and we spoke up at a banquet up in Augusta, Maine. And, of course, I've seen Marty a few times since then, and uh, it's certainly good to reminisce old times. It's good to see... Marty here tonight, and uh, what words more can I say, but it certainly is with a great deal of pleasure that I introduce to you Marty Mann. I'm sharing Wes's feelings of being really moved on this occasion. High Watch Farm has always meant a great deal to me. It's given me a lot, a lot more than I've ever given it. And I haven't been nearly as close to it in recent years as I would wish. But to hear the kind of thing that Wes was saying about the exploits of the graduates, and to see this kind of a group gathered together to celebrate the 25th anniversary, I think tells its own story of what the farm has done and what it means to a great many people. I want to start by telling you something I heard quite recently. I was in Kansas City two weeks ago, and while I was there, a friend of mine celebrated his 10th anniversary and afterwards invited a lot of people to his home. And a girl came over to me and she said, you're from the East, do you know anything? Have you ever heard of High Watch Farm? I said, yes, I have. She said, well, you know, we're all talking about it out here. One of our girls has come back from there, and she has the best quality AA that we've ever seen. And she said, I've been sober four or five years. I forget which it was. But she said, I want to go there, and I am determined to get there next year. Can I go? <laughs> I said, yes, I think you could go. People do go there for vacations, too. And then she proceeded to go on and on and on about how wonderful this place must be because of what it had done uh, for her friend in Kansas City. So you see, it isn't just in New York and Connecticut and around our own bailiwick uh, that the farm has gained uh, a wonderful reputation, but it's now spreading right across the country. I didn't realize that uh, you were getting people from that far away, Wes, and I think it's wonderful. When I was thinking about what I'd say tonight, it seemed to me that perhaps the thing that would come best at this time was a very simple description of how we, and I mean AA, uh, found the farm, how we came in contact with it. Now this involves a little bit of my own story. 
And so I will begin there. Uh, many of you have heard my story, and I'm not going into all of it. I don't expect to uh, cut too much into the time of the orchestra and the dancing. But suffice it to say that at the end of five years of hell on earth, which I don't have to describe to very many people in this room, I had finally found a doctor who was willing to take me under his wing. He was the eighth that I had tried in a year. None of the others were willing to take me on. They had all told me that I could, uh, I had better commit myself to a state institution, and when I said for how long, they wouldn't tell me. So they confirmed in my mind my own belief that I was insane and that it was a type of insanity for which there was no hope and that once I walked in and those gates clanged behind me, that would be it. So I wasn't very eager to do it. But the eighth man said he thought maybe he could help me. He said his name was Dr. Foster Kennedy and he was a very famous neurologist and psychiatrist and I had been given an appointment with him as a Christmas present. Uh, by a friend who was impressed by the fact that I was trying not to drink. I'd lasted six weeks. And that was quite a feat, I can tell you. And this had impressed her sufficiently, and I was so anxious to get some kind of help, and she rather agreed with me that I was nuts. And uh, she felt maybe this man could help me. So I saw him. And he was the head of the neurological division at Bellevue. What he told me was that people like me, in his experience, had one chance in a hundred, but that I wanted to get well so badly that he thought maybe I was that one. And on the chance that I was that one, he would take me on as a patient. I might mention here that I was broke. That's why my appointment was a Christmas present. And it had something to do, I think, with the turndowns I'd received from the seven doctors I had seen during the previous year. But he told me that he would get me into his ward in Bellevue, the neurological ward. He did not think I was insane, he said. He didn't think I belonged in the psychiatric wing. And he would put me in the neurological ward and he would see me there at least once a week and we would then see what happened. So that's where I went. And I spent seven months in Bellevue. During that time, I never got out, of course. They take your clothes away when you go in there, and there isn't any way to get out. And so I was sober. I had a lot of minor ailments that they were taking care of. Actually, you get extremely good care in Bellevue, medical care. And every week, Dr. Kennedy would ask me how I felt about it and did I think that I was ready to go out. And I don't know where I got the insight. I don't know how I knew that much, but I knew enough to say, no, I'm not. I'd probably be all right as long as things went well. But if I hit any problems, and I'm bound to, broke, no job, really nowhere to go, I know I'll drink. I'd been, incidentally, completely honest about my drinking with all the doctors. It just never occurred to me not to be. Because I recognized that it was, well, it was the kind of drinking I did that made me think I was insane. So that's what I was there for. This was in 1937, and I never once heard the word alcoholism mentioned by anybody. I didn't know the word myself. I knew I drank too much. I'd certainly been called a lot of unpleasant names by friends, uh, other names than alcoholic. That's a nice name, I may add, compared to the other ones. So I recognized that if I drank again, I would be right back where I was, uh, that it would be impossible, and I was afraid to go out. And I kept insisting to Dr. Kennedy that this wasn't enough that just being locked up in the hospital and physically cared for was not going to straighten out whatever it was that was wrong, and that I needed a psychiatrist. Now, he didn't practice as a psychiatrist. He practiced more as a neurologist. And I was quite aware, in any case, that I wasn't likely to get that much of his time. He was a $50 a half hour man. 
And the time that he gave to Bellevue, of course, was free. This was a free gift contribution that he made so that I saw him down there, but I wasn't likely to become a private patient. And yet I had to have help from somewhere, and I finally convinced him. And he found a young psychiatrist that was doing some research work at Bellevue that agreed to see me while I was there. And I saw this young man, oh, perhaps eight or ten times, during the course of which he came to agree with me that what I needed was long-term psychiatric help, such as he could not give me, nor could he see me on any really regular basis. He was seeing me when he had a chance. And he reported this back to Dr. Kennedy, and Dr. Kennedy took enough interest in me to make an effort to find a private sanitarium that would accept me as a patient. He found that place. It was called Blythewood. It was in Greenwich, and its medical director was named Dr. Harry Tebow. And Dr. Tebow came into New York once a week to interview people who were thinking of coming to Blythewood or whose families wanted to put someone in Blythewood. And he saw me to see whether they would take me. Remember, I was broke. I had to be taken on as a charity case. Now, many good private institutions take a few people uh, for free. They don't tell anybody else, so you aren't uh, pointed at or anything. You, don't, you aren't made to feel one bit different from the ones who are paying two or $300 a week. But I had known that this was so because I had tried to get in on that basis into Riggs Sanitarium up in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, in, uh, sometime before Stockbridge, Massachusetts and had not been able to do it. And Thibault interviewed me to see whether he thought that I was worth taking on on that basis. Obviously, if they were going to take someone on uh, for free, they wanted it to be someone they felt they could help and someone who was going to benefit from it and someone whom they felt was worth helping. And I was very fortunate in that he decided I was worthy and they accepted me and I moved from Bellevue up to Blythewood, and it was like going from hell to heaven. Because Blythewood was a very beautiful place in Greenwich. It had 500 acres. This was in June that I made the move. I'd been in Bellevue since January 2nd. And it was just almost too good to be true. And when I got there, I found that in the house where I was, where the common rooms and also the dining room. The dining room was not too big and there were two sittings. And they assigned me to the second sitting and uh, they said that I would be sitting with three women and I was introduced to those three women and I had dinner with them. And we began to talk and uh, it turned out that one of them I had heard all about because just a few weeks before, there had been a wonderful story in the newspaper, I had read it in my hospital bed in Bellevue, of this young woman from the South whose husband had brought her up to New York and put her in doctor's hospital. And although her clothes had been taken away from her, she had escaped from the hospital at two o'clock in the morning uh, in her nightgown and mink coat and disappeared. And the papers were full of this disappearance. And three or four days later, uh, the story was that she had been found. Well, here she was. She was in Blythewood. And I was enthralled with this story. I thought this was a fascinating thing she'd done. And so I asked her all about it. And uh, naturally, she was an alcoholic. I don't have to tell you that, do I? What she had done when she got out of there, she hailed a cab and... Uh, her nightgown and her bedroom slippers didn't look too different from an evening dress, so the cab driver had taken her. And she was so clever. She had gone to the Martha Washington Hotel. Now that is a beautiful old lady's home, respectable to a degree, and certainly nowhere that anyone would look for an escaped drunk. So no one had found her. And she'd managed quite nicely by having things sent up to her room until finally she decided she wanted to go out. And also she'd been drinking for several days by then. Uh, so she began calling up the department stores where she had accounts and having clothes sent down. And that's how they found her. 
And so her husband had picked her up, and there she was in Blythewood. This was one of the three. Uh, the second one I don't remember too much about. She was not an alcoholic. She was a manic depressive, it so happened. And the third one was kind of a mystery. She claimed that she was in simply because she was convalescing from a severe illness. And uh, she had come there for the rest. Now, she lived in Old Greenwich, just a minute away. And her name was Nona Wyman. But she was not terribly amused by Martha's story. I was. Martha and I became very great friends. And Nona was kind of on the periphery. She was there, I would say, about six weeks after I came. And then she went home. And she used to invite Martha and me for lunch and a swim. And we would go over and have lunch with her and swim. And uh, as I say, she was a kind of remote person. She didn't give very much. And uh, we couldn't quite make her out. We used to talk about it and wonder. It seemed an odd thing to go to a sanitarium of that type just to rest up from an illness, to be frank. We couldn't quite get it. But neither of us were suspicious. And now we will skip. I was in Blythewood in all 15 months. And it was about eight months after I had come there that Dr. Tebow called me in one day and said that he had come across something. He'd been given a book to read. It was a manuscript. It wasn't a book. And that he thought maybe this was what I needed. Because I may say that during that seven or eight months, I had on several occasions gotten very drunk indeed right there. Uh, it's always possible to get drinks, you know. You can't be locked up really where you can't get them. Men get them in jails and prisons. People get them in sanitariums, and I managed to get liquor. And also, we weren't locked up behind bars. We were free to go into Greenwich or Costco shopping, and occasionally... I could go into New York to the dentist or to go to a theater, and I'd go in and come back perfectly all right. Half a dozen times, eight times, the ninth time I'd come back roaring drunk. I never intended to. Thibault and I would dig and try to find out why I'd done this, and it never seemed to make very much sense. Excepting looking back later, I could see that one thing I had been doing was testing out how well was I doing? You see, Harry Tebow was the only psychiatrist in that institution who told his patients, the alcoholics, that they could never drink again. All of the other psychiatrists were teaching their patients how to drink again. Because, of course, if this was purely an underlying personality disorder, and you got treatment for that, and the disorder got straightened out, naturally you drink the way you used to. Now, this is perfect logic. The only trouble is it doesn't work. But I always figured I had the wrong doctor. <laughs> Tebow was the kind of guy who didn't like to drink much, you know, and I just thought he was a sourpuss who didn't want anybody else to drink. It used to make me very angry. And particularly, my friend Martha had a doctor who was teaching her how to drink and uh, several other patients that I knew well, by that time, their doctors were teaching them how to drink, so why was I so unlucky as to get a doctor who said I couldn't drink? So naturally, I was trying it out to see how well I was doing. Was I arriving at the point where I could drink the way I used to, or wasn't I? And I never was. But it had got to a pitch where Tebow had said to me, frankly, that if it happened again, there really wasn't much point in my staying there, because he felt he'd done all he could, and... Uh, I had done all I could, and if it wasn't working, it wasn't any point. Well, now, here I was. This was my last hope. And it was certainly something I had wanted desperately. And yet, I didn't stop drinking. I just took greater care not to get caught. And this had been going on for a couple of months, and I hadn't got caught. 
When, as I said, Dr. Tebow called me in and said that he had been reading this manuscript and he thought maybe this was something that would help me. And he handed it to me and the title of it was Alcoholics Anonymous. Many of you have heard me tell of what happened to me with that book. I think I will tell you again because I think it has a relation to the farm and to its meaning for me and for many of us. When I started reading the book, I was thrilled to death because here for the first time I found out what was wrong. See, even Tebow didn't use the word alcoholism. That word just wasn't used in the 1930s by anybody. So here was a description. It had a name, and I was very happy about that. I love the word alcoholism. I never had the slightest trouble accepting it or the word alcoholic. It said it was a disease. It gave a description of the disease that explained what Tipo had been unable to explain. It said that it was an allergy of the body coupled with an obsession of the mind and that nothing could be done to change whatever this was in the body that had gone wrong or was always wrong or whatever, which made it impossible for your body to take alcohol normally. But something could be done about the obsession of the mind that drove you to drink against your own will very often when you didn't want to, and that this was a program to deal with the obsession of the mind. Well. At last, I could understand why it was that I couldn't go back to drinking the way I used to. Something had changed in my body, or maybe it was always there, and I would never be able to take alcohol normally. And I accepted it. The only trouble with this book was that no sooner had I found these wonderful things in it that I fell flat on my face over the word God. This I couldn't handle. I wanted no part of it. I'd outgrown that when I was 17. It was self-hypnotism. Oh, a long list of things. Anyway, I was telling Tebow all about it at every session. I would read enough of the book to have ammunition and I'd go and tear it apart to him. Also, I didn't like the way the book was written. They didn't know how to write those people, whoever they were. They sounded real weirdies to me. And it just wasn't for me. It was too bad, but it just wasn't for me. And all I got from Tebow when I'd get through with this harangue was, Would you just go back and read a bit more. So I dragged my feet. And I spent over a month not even getting to the middle of the book. Little weensy bit at a time. Hating every step of it. Fighting every step of it. And then something happened in my life that affected a member of my family, and I felt that my being where I was was the cause of it. I was responsible, and there was nothing whatever that I could do about it, but nothing. And it filled me with a kind of anger I had never felt before, and I never have since, thank God, because I really saw red. I was in my room, and I had a little tiny room up on the third floor. It had been an attic room in this house once, with a little window under the eaves, and apparently the book was open on my bed as I raged. And you can imagine what I was thinking. I'm going out and get two bottles, and I'm going to get drunker than I ever got, and I'm going to tear this place apart, and I'll show them. Now, this is very typical of an alcoholic, as you all know. We are so smart that when we get angry at somebody else, we pick up the biggest sledgehammer we can find, and we beat our own brains in. Real intelligent we are. And while this was going on, my eye fell on this book that was open on the bed. And I couldn't read. I didn't try. I wasn't looking to read. But there in the middle of the page, something stood out, a line, as if it was in block letters, black and high and sharp. And it said simply, we cannot live with anger. And that did it. God knows why. What it was in those words that acted like a battering ram to the last of my resistance. Why those words did it, I have no idea. I only know that when I realized where I was, 
I must have been on my knees beside the bed for quite a while because there was a big wet spot on the bedspread from the tears. I had been praying. I knew. I knew not only that there was a God, but that God was there. I had such a feeling of freedom. Well, it's almost, it, it, it isn't possible to describe it. That was the sensation, that I was free, utterly and completely free. So much so that I knew I could walk out of that little window under the eaves up on the third floor and keep right on walking. I knew it. I started over toward that window, and a grain of sense said, stop, go tell Tebow first. Maybe you're really nuts now. So I rushed downstairs and beat on his door. His office was in that same house. And when he opened the door and when he saw my face, he put his patient right out and took me in. And he said, what's happened? And I told him, and he questioned me closely. And he said at the end, no, he said, you're not insane. He said, I think you've had a perfectly valid spiritual experience. Many people have had them. There's a book about it. Get William James' variety of religious experience, and you'll see how many people have had things of this sort. He said, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. Hang on to it. Now go on back upstairs and finish that book. So I did. And somebody would switched books. It was a brand new book up there. Never seen it before. It was the most wonderful book I'd ever read. <laughs> Wonderfully written. I loved everything in it. I read it through at one gulp. And when I was finished, I started and read it all over again. It was for me, that book. So I walked around on a cloud for quite a few weeks, postponing the evil day when I might have to meet some of the people who'd written the book. This I didn't want to do. I'd always been scared of people, particularly meeting new people. And I got away with this for almost a month until finally one day Dr. Tebow picked up the phone, called New York and said she will be in tonight. It was meeting night once a week in those days on Tuesday night in Bill's and Lois's house in Brooklyn. And in I went. And that was my introduction to AA. I hadn't been in that room 10 minutes before I knew that this was where I belonged, that I had come home that I had found my own people. I have never changed that feeling. I get it frequently all over again when I go to a new country, for instance, or to a place where I haven't been, and go into an AA meeting or an AA club, and there's nobody there that I've known before, and in five minutes, you know how it is. You feel as if you'd known them forever. And I had that feeling immediately. Dr. Tebow wanted me to remain on at Blythewood, although I felt perfectly ready then to pick up and go my way. I was kind of a guinea pig. I think he wanted to see what, had hap what would happen. And so I stayed almost six months. And finally, in mid-September, I was due to go. This was 1939. I had attended my first meeting on April 13th. Two days before I left, the ambulance had screamed up, and a stretcher had been carried out, and there was a girl in a straitjacket on the stretcher, and it was Nona Wyman. And she had been brought back. Nona, of course, was an alcoholic. But she wasn't giving in those earlier talks between Martha and me about our drinking exploits. She just never told anybody anything. I didn't get to see her because she was not seeable those two days. And she was a patient of another doctor. She was a patient of one of the doctors that taught his patients how to drink. So I came back to Blythewood nearly every weekend for many months. And I attempted to see Nona for two or three weeks running. And her psychiatrist did not want me to talk to her about AA. He didn't believe in it. He didn't know what it was that had happened to me, but apparently he didn't like it. 
or he didn't think it would last or something. And I was very distressed about this, but I wasn't getting anywhere. There wasn't much I could do. And one day in New York, I had a telegram from her psychiatrist saying that she had run away, that she was apparently holed up in, I forget whether it was not the Lexington Hotel, but the hotel on Lexington Avenue. And would I do what I could? Would I go and see her? So I went over. Well, she was really in a bad way. She was terribly drunk. She was suicidal. It wasn't possible, really, to talk to her. We had a member in those early days who was a doctor. And I called him because she was really beyond my handling. And he came over and gave her a shot to quiet her and said he would try to get a nurse for the night if I would relieve the nurse at eight in the morning. He thought he could get one for the night. He didn't think he could get one or get them around the clock. He did get a nurse for the night. I did relieve her at eight in the morning. And Nona woke up more or less in her right mind and I started talking AA. Of course, I had the book with me. And I started reading it out loud to her. She was receptive. She was willing to listen. And as we talked and I read, this went on all morning long, she started telling me about a farm. She said that one reason she hadn't felt that she could talk about this or even that there was much needed to be done about it was that she had found a part answer. That she and her husband both drank too much but they had a friend who had suggested some three or four years before that that they go up to a place in Connecticut where this friend thought they might find some help. And they had started going up to this farm near Kent, which was run by a very strange little old lady, she said, who called herself Sister Frances who was a deeply spiritual person, and the farm was run on spiritual lines. She said, you know, I believe that this AA that you're telling me about is exactly what she's trying to do. I think she'd be very excited about this. Because Walter and I are not the only people like us that have gone to that farm. And she said, the interesting thing was that I never wanted a drink while I was up there. I never drank while I was at the farm. But I wouldn't be home very long before I'd start again. And Walter, who came up for weekends, she'd stay the whole summer, never drank while he was up there either, no matter what condition he arrived in or for his vacation that he spent up there. She said, it does something strange to you. I don't know what it is. It's wonderful. But of course, we can't live there all the time, so there, must, there has to be something that'll work when we're not there. But it has something, that place. And I know that Sister Frances would believe in what you're telling me because this is the kind of thing that, that she's trying to do. You've got to come and see it. Well, to collapse things a little bit, Nona and Walter had already separated and uh, their affairs were in the hands of a lawyer. They started proceedings for divorce. And... She decided after four or five days that she would see Walter personally instead of just through the lawyer, and she did, and she was sober, and he was so startled, he wanted to know how she'd done it. And she told him about AA, and he joined too. A few weeks later, the two of them succeeded in getting some of us to agree to go up and see this remarkable place. It was a beautiful weekend in October, toward the end of October. And we drove up. There was Bill and Lois and Horace Crystal and Bert Taylor and myself with the Wymans. Uh, all of you know what it's like as you come over the hill and, or come up to the top of the hill and suddenly there's that adorable little house with just a smallish barn across from it in those days. And we were all much struck by it, and I think you also know how beautiful it is in October. It was a lovely day. But as we got out of the car and walked up to the house, Bill was right behind me. 
And we stepped over the threshold, and Bill turned to me, and he said, My God, he said, you could cut it with a knife. And I said, yes, you could. The atmosphere. The feeling. There was something there. Something that was really palpable. That you could feel. And every one of us felt it. To say that we fell in love with it is not to use the right terminology at all. We were engulfed in it. That was one of the most wonderful weekends I have ever spent. We walked through the woods. We saw all the little cabins. We had a roaring fire in the fireplace. We talked far into the night with this extraordinary woman called Sister Frances, who was a very lovely person with a wonderful sense of humor, incidentally. Because when we asked her why she called us, she called us all sister and brother, every one of us. She said she did this because she had such a bad memory for names. And this solved the problem. She called everybody sister or brother. And the reason she called herself Sister Francis was because St. Francis of Assisi was her favorite saint, and she also had a great feeling for animals. That's why she was a vegetarian and would never wear any animal skin. She only wore canvas shoes. She didn't wear anything that had come from an animal, nor did she ever eat any meat or flesh. And she had adopted St. Francis' name. Her real name was Ethelred Folsom. I'm not surprised she took Francis. <laughs> Before that weekend was over, and I think I'm making it clear as I intended to do that Wes and others have given me far too much credit. I was merely an instrument. I was a bridge. And I was a bridge because I tried to help an alcoholic named Nona. The farm was a direct result of something we all do that we call 12th step work, for which no individual deserves any credit, in my opinion. And what is at the farm was already at the farm before we ever found it. It found us, in my opinion. The story of that farm, as I had it from Sister Frances, is pretty fascinating. She had gone on a spiritual search, oh, 30, 40 years before, not finding what she wanted in her own Orthodox Church. And she had become interested in the study of metaphysics, and she had gone and studied with a woman named Emma Curtis Hopkins, who had been a teacher of metaphysics at the same time as Mary Baker Eddy, but lived longer than Mary Baker Eddy and who had gone in a different direction from Christian science, although there were many basic things that were similar. And Sister Frances had lived in Boston for several years studying with Emma Curtis Hopkins and had adopted this philosophy as her belief and her way of life. And she had felt that she wanted to do something concrete about it, that this was something the world needed, that people needed. And she had some money. And she set out looking for a place. And apparently she searched for a long while until one day she found this. It's really a cup in the hills. And there were three farms in this cup. And she bought all three of them. And her original idea was that one of them would be for older people who could retire there and devote themselves to spiritual study. One would be for children who were to be brought up in this way of thinking without fear and in love. And I'm quoting from Sister Frances. And the middle one, this was to be the come and go one. This was the place for people who were in trouble of any kind, whether it was physical trouble or mental trouble or spiritual trouble, material trouble, that they could come up there and stay as long as they liked. The idea being that they could try to find themselves, and if they did, they would go away refreshed and able once again to cope with life. Well, Sister Frances was a true idealist. She lived up to her ideals. There was no money involved in this. There was a basket that hung on the door. And people who came were expected to put in the basket whatever they wanted to. 
So it wasn't too long before she lost two of the three farms. Not enough money was in the baskets. And she herself had put most of what she had into the original purchase. But the middle farm, the one that was the in and out farm, is the one that remained, and it is the one that today we call High Watch. She called it Joy Farm. She had incorporated, uh, for tax purposes and other reasons, because one of the things that she did there was to print and distribute the writings of Emma Curtis Hopkins. And in the wing of the house, down in the lower part, there was a printing press and enormous stocks of literature when I first went up there. And they were mailed out from there, the pamphlets all over the world. And people came there from all over the world. There was an English woman living there. At that time, there was a Russian woman. Uh, there were several Indians that uh, were there on and off during the first couple of years. Uh, the farm was known all over the world, and people came there. But the thing that really happened to Sister Frances when she met A.A. was that she fell in love with A.A. This, she felt, was putting into practice what she believed in. And she felt that those of us whom she met were living the way she believed. And we, God knows, appreciated what was there. We all made use of the little chapel, we all went in there for our quiet time. And before the end of the weekend, she'd offered it to us, lock, stock, and barrel. She said, take it. She said, we're incorporated as a nonprofit corporation, the Ministry of the High Watch. That's where that name came from. There are two or three board members whom I know would agree with me entirely that you people can use this place the way it ought to be used. Take it. And Bill said, no, we can't take it. AA doesn't own any property and doesn't want to. We can use it, but we won't take it. And that's how it was. Now, Walter Wyman had already gone on the board at her request, even before he joined AA and sobered up. Because after all, remember, she saw him sober when he was up there, and he was a very nice man, very fine man. And she then asked if some one of us would go on the board, and I was tapped for it, so I went on the board. And we began making use of the farm. And when I say making use of it, what I mean is that we would take somebody up there for a week or two weeks, usually stay with them. Many of us in those early days of 39, 40, 41, 42 didn't have jobs. We were free to do this kind of thing. There wasn't any money involved unless we wanted to put it down, and we began making payments when we stayed up there as much as we could. Sister Frances lived there all the time at that point, and so did this English woman, and so did the Russian woman in the first year. I went up there so frequently I was working like a beaver to get some women into AA and not having very much luck. I was always taking someone up there. So I saw a great deal of it, and the following summer, I spent my, by that time had a job, I spent my vacation up there, and there was a little cabin that became, in effect, mine, the one I always used and stayed in. Unfortunately, it burned down one winter. Somebody got the stove too hot and went out for a walk, and it burned down. But it was, it was a real home for me. It was for most of us, and we loved it. And for several years, we didn't think about doing anything more than simply taking people up there. It was the atmosphere that we took them for. First place, it got them away from the drinking situation and their own situation, whatever it was. And in the second place, there isn't any question that there was something healing just about being there. And it was during that time, several years after that, I think, that my mother came east and we were supporting my mother, and I didn't have very much money, and neither did my sisters or brother. And mother went up and lived at the farm, and she ran the farm for about a year. And then I was up there a great deal and saw a lot of it. And incidentally, it was open the year round in those days. 
Before my mother came east, there was one other very personal connection I had with it. I've never hidden the fact that I had three slips after I came into AA. And uh, the first and the third were both over the holidays, Christmas and New Year's. The other one was in the middle, in the summer. Three within one year. It was in my first year and a half. And the third slip that I had, I started to drink. I called for help. It was the day before New Year's. And a friend drove me up to the farm. And the snow was about six feet deep. You couldn't come in from the Kent side. We came in the back road and got stuck in the snow and had to walk the last mile and a half. And I was like this. So I know what the farm means to someone who needs it because I needed it and I found there what I needed. So I've had that experience with it too. These are some of the reasons why I feel so close to it and why I am so deeply moved by this event here. Gradually, Sister Frances was getting older and didn't feel that she wanted to be there all the time and felt that someone from AA that knew how to, how to deal with these people ought to be there. And we began trying to find somebody who would manage it. And it was during this period that I was vice president of the board. Sister Frances was president, but she wouldn't act, so I had to act as president. Ed Hare tells me that he has been looking through some of those early records, and it's Marty Mann did this and Marty Mann did that. Well, she had to. <laughs> there wasn't much choice. And we hadn't been able to get too much interest in, uh, in doing any work about it. But little by little, people became more interested in it, particularly as people came away from there and stayed sober. Dating way back from the period of my mother sitting right down there in front of me is Mary Hemp. There are a number of people here, I think, that went to the farm quite early, that were early graduates of it before it was even uh, thought to do it on the basis it's being done now. But gradually, little by little, it was transformed into truly an AA place. Now, you know that AA as such doesn't own it. But in effect, today, AA runs it. And there's something I very much want to say. As a board member, I served during a number of years when we were having difficulty finding the right person to run the farm. And long after I went off the board, the difficulties persisted. It was not easy to find the right person. And sometimes we had someone who was the right person but didn't want to go on doing it. And it was, uh, it was somewhat of a problem. But from all that I hear and from all that I've seen when I've been up there, that problem has been ended ever since the Irvines moved to the farm. So this makes me particularly happy that after 25 years, here is a going concern doing a tremendous amount of good, being used to its fullest potential. And I think anyone who has been there knows what I'm talking about when I talk about the atmosphere. And I know one thing. I know that Kay and Wes know exactly what I'm talking about. And that they have been able to use that to see that people kept coming up there had the chance to feel it and appreciate it. It's a very great gift that was given to us, I think. I know of no one who was happier at the way that gift was being used than Sister Frances herself. And her only unhappiness was a short period when she was in a place that was too far away for her to get to the farm as often as she wanted to in her last few years. Many of us who have known it and loved it will always feel that it's ours, too. And I suspect that anyone that's been up there gets that feeling. You can't help feeling a little proprietary about it. it. It enters your heart in such a way that it does become a part of you. It is a great healing force. 
It is a very wonderful thing that has been made available to us. I have visited a great many places that have indeed sprung up in its image, and others that sprang up not knowing anything about it. And many of them are very good, and many of them are doing a good job and helping a lot of people. But I have never been anywhere in the world that has the thing I'm talking about that exists at the farm. And I, it's a feeble word, atmosphere. I don't quite know how to describe it. There is something in the air. There, God has his finger on it. Thank God. Thank you very much, Marty. It certainly was interesting to me, and I'm sure to many of, of you sitting out there to hear how High Watch started and, as Marty says, how it's doing now. And I'm sure that many of the graduates, so to speak, feel the same way. Now, uh, <clears throat> this is uh, when we come to the close of the regular meeting. And I know that uh, some of the younger people and members are looking forward to a few uh, rounds around the room with their favorite uh, girl. And I imagine all the tables have to be taken away, so there will be a uh, short uh, intermission before the music starts. And uh, in closing, I'd just like to say that it's been a privilege for me to do the best I could up here tonight, and uh, it certainly is a privilege for me to be part of, of the High Watch uh, farm, and I do hope that uh, what I found in AA, if I can just uh, perhaps help somebody up there, and if nothing more than by the example that each and every one of us uh, set to one another when we stay away from that one drink one day at a time. And so in a few minutes, I believe there will be uh, dancing and uh, we can all walk around and meet old friends and uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. And I believe, uh, I, I must say that I forgot to ask, but do we close in the usual manner if we'd all care to join in the usual manner? Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.